Part 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and the receptionist at a courier company. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 8. Good afternoon, this is Rourke's Courier Service. Pat speaking. How can I help you? Hello, Pat. My name's Joanne, and I would like to courier a package, if I may. You may certainly, Joanne. What's your surname, please? It's Jefferson with one F. That's J-E-F-E-R-S-O-N. Thank you, Joanne. Now, could you tell me the address where the package will be collected from? Yes, it's my home address, so that's 22 Blue Lane Close, Old Malden, Surrey, KPT 530. Very good. I guess you also need the recipient's details. Quite right. Let's start with the name. It's Michael Muriati, that's M-U-R-I-A-R-T-Y. And the address, please? Michael lives on Birkdale Road at number 97. That's in Ashford, Kent. Excellent. And have you got Mike's postcode handy? Yeah, it's uh, K29ZY8. I'll just repeat that. K-T-9-S-Y-8. Sorry, that's a Z, not an S. Got it? Got it. Do you have a daytime contact number for Michael? I certainly do. It's 011-876-99671. And when do you want your package delivered, Joanne? This Friday, the 22nd of May, if possible. No problem. Is there a particular time of day we should make the delivery at? Well, not really. Michael's self-employed, you see, and he works from home. I guess you can deliver at any time, though I think he'd prefer the evening, as he tends to be very busy during the day. Evening delivery. Now, one last thing. Can you tell me what the package will contain? There's a silver photo frame and a man's watch. Together they're worth about £200. Super. And are you sending the package because birthday or something, is it? Actually, it's a gift for his wedding anniversary. His wife and he have been married for 50 years. Can you believe it? That's impressive. Hope I'm as lucky. I assume you accept plastic. We take all major credit cards as well as bank drafts and cheques. Excellent. I'll give you my card details now then, shall I? Not necessary. We don't charge in advance. You should give them to the courier in person on the day. Gotcha. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 9 to 10. Now, delivery will cost you £50, but I can recommend something. Of course. If I were you, I'd take out our goods in transit insurance, as your package is quite valuable. Isn't that included in the price, then? No, you're only covered for theft, but not for accidental loss. Surely you're responsible if the product gets mislaid. Not since the recent change in legislation. Customers are now required to take out an additional insurance to cover this risk. That's ridiculous. So I pay £50 and have to cough up more money if I want to make sure my package doesn't get misplaced. What am I paying you for? I'm sorry, Joanne. I wish I could change the situation, but I can't. How much is this insurance, then? £2. Oh, well, why didn't you say so? In that case, I'll take it. Great. Well, that should be everything for the moment, Joanne. We'll give you a call let you know we're coming. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheerio then. That is the end of part one.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a museum guide talking to her tour group. First, you will have time to look at questions 11 to 15. Welcome everyone. You are standing at the entrance of one of Britain's oldest and most prestigious museums, the National Art Museum. My name is Sarah and I'll be your guide today. I hope you'll get as much enjoyment out of taking the tour of the museum as I will taking you on it. OK, let's get started then, shall we? Directly in front of you, where you came in, you can see the cafe. We'll have time to stop there for refreshments a little later, but for now we need to pass through it and make our way to the Renaissance Period Hall. Come along. Look here. There's a door at the back of the cafe, but we're going through the door on the left for the moment. Follow me. OK, our tour starts here, in the Renaissance Period Hall. But before we look at some of the wonderful works of art which adorn these walls, let's glance at the map of the museum and discuss the itinerary for the rest of the morning. We don't need to go back out through the cafe to get to the Classical Period Exhibition Centre. There's a door right here at the back of the Renaissance Period Hall, which leads right through. And that's our next port of call. Then we're going to leave the Classical Period Exhibition Centre and I'm going to take you back out through a doorway into the main corridor. There's a lovely exhibition of works by London artists dating from as far back as 1500 there. From the corridor, it's off to the information desk to pick up some leaflets for the next section we'll visit, the Albert Gallery. That's here, at the bottom left of the map as you look at it, and the entrance is just opposite the information desk. Behind the information desk, by the way, you'll find the men's and ladies, should anyone need to excuse themselves momentarily. Our last stop takes us back out into the main corridor, through the ticket office and into a very special section, which we only have the pleasure of seeing on account of the fact that we're on a guided tour, the Restoration Office. Here, We'll be able to see professional restorers at work, delicately repairing centuries-old works of art, some of which are priceless. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Getting back to where we are right now then, look around you and behold the brilliance of the human mind, which seems to know no bounds, creatively speaking at any rate. We are surrounded by paintings from one of the most exciting periods of art history. The Renaissance was not just a revival, it was a reinvention of many artistic concepts. Study the painting to your left carefully. It's a self-portrait of Alberti, 
one of the pioneers of the Renaissance movement. Alberti did much to develop the understanding of perspective in art. It is no coincidence either that he was also a strong advocate of realism, since a thorough grasp of perspective and the optical considerations of creating a piece of art is a prerequisite for achieving an end result which is an accurate reflection of what the artist is trying to depict, which of course is a core aim of realism. Alberti regarded maths as the common ground of art and science and did much to promote the taking of a scientific approach among his peers. No more for his knowledge of theory than for his creations, Alberti was nonetheless an accomplished artist, sculptor, poet, author and linguist. He and his peers led Europe's awakening from a period of ignorance and intellectual poverty known as the Dark Ages. As a humanist, he advocated a wide, all-encompassing education curriculum which focused as much on culture and morality as it did on traditional fields of learning. He laid the foundations for a period of enlightenment and renewed intellectual vigour. Perhaps names such as da Vinci and Michelangelo are more synonymous with the period. And indeed, artistically speaking, these gentlemen undoubtedly achieved far more than Alberti ever did. However, his contribution should not be overlooked or dismissed lightly, for it was a catalyst for much of what was to come later, surpassing his own achievements. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You hear a discussion between a couple and a real estate agent. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now this first property I'm going to show you will be ready for letting in about two weeks. It's on the market for £1,500 per calendar month, but the landlord is open to offers. If after the viewing you think you might be interested, might I suggest that you make an offer, however, as a property like this won't stay on the market for very long? My first impressions are good, I have to say. I like the location. It seems to be a quiet residential area, and the proximity to the common is advantageous, as we like to go for walks together in the evening. What do you think, Becca? It does look rather impressive, Nick. Let's go inside, shall we? Now, as you can see, the front door opens into this lovely, spacious reception room where you can welcome guests. Let me lead you into the kitchen area, which is just through here. I know I've asked you this already, but I just want to make sure that the furniture stays, correct? Yes. Everything you see here will remain on the property. The only things the landlord is taking with him are his television and DVD player. Why is he vacating such a lovely flat as this? He and his wife have just had their first child, and they felt it was time to look for somewhere more spacious which can accommodate a family more comfortably. They've just purchased a three-bed house in one of the city's suburbs, but they were eager to hold on to this property too, which is why they've decided to let it out. They now look at their old home as an investment proposition. Very sensible. The size of the kitchen is something I have a little bit of an issue with, though. After all, while there are plenty of counters and workspaces, there isn't a kitchen table or anywhere to eat. True, but come through here and you'll find a very generous dining area. 
Wow, this is roomy. We could definitely entertain here, Nick. Do you mind if we view the bedroom and bathroom next? Of course. This way. Here's the master bedroom. There's a small room off to the side there that could arguably be used as a second bedroom, but I think the lack of space makes it better suited to acting as an office. Your ensuite bathroom is through here. It looks very modern. Has it been recently decorated? Better than that. In fact, the bathroom is completely new. It was only fitted last week. The house has also been given a professional clean, and all of the rooms were redecorated after the landlord moved out. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. You can probably tell we like it. I'm glad to hear. But now let's get down to business. It's on the market at fifteen hundred. You said right. Right. Well, realistically, what do you think the landlord would be willing to accept? I would say offers over fourteen hundred. Well, I'm not prepared to offer that. I'll make an initial offer of twelve hundred, and if that is rejected. I may consider upping my offer by one hundred pounds, but that's as high as I'll go. As you wish. You are happy with an initial contract of twelve months, I presume. Yes, assuming there's a break clause after six. That's no problem. The standard contract allows you to give two months' notice that you will vacate the flat from the fourth month onwards. Effectively, you can vacate any time after the sixth month. Provided you give the proper notice in advance. All sounds good. So, what happens next? I will put your offer to the landlord, and if he accepts it, you'll be asked to put down a holding deposit of five hundred pounds to take the property off the market. Then, assuming your reference and credit checks come back okay, we can sign the letting agreement and get you moved in. Before you sign the contract, though, on top of the five hundred pound holding deposit. You will have to put down a further four weeks' rent in payment of the full bond deposit, as well as fronting up your first month's rent in advance. What about your fees? We charge one hundred and twenty pounds per person to cover our administrative costs and reference checking. So times that by two, and that's what you will have to pay me. Okay. Well, thank you. We'll need a couple of hours to think it over. But we'll give you a call as soon as we decide one way or the other. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a talk about how to attract birds to your garden. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. The best way to attract birds to your garden is by satisfying their basic needs, which are the need for water, the need for food, and the need for safety. Birds drink water and bathe in it, and many also use it to make mud to build their nests. A simple bird bath, which can be nothing more complicated than a shallow dish, 
will therefore attract birds. Don't use tin pans, as these get hot under the heat of the sun. In fact, a cement bowl is probably going to be the most effective bath to use. But make sure that it is no more than 6.5 centimetres deep. The best time of all to attract birds to your garden, and indeed the time when they need your help most, is during the winter season. During summer, birds can find most of their food on their own and are largely self-sufficient. In winter, however, they benefit greatly from the help of their human friends. Often, when it is cold, an ice or frost crust may form over the ground, covering the bird's natural food supply. It is when this happens that they really need your help with feeding. It is probably best, though, to start feeding from late autumn onwards. That way the birds will become used to finding food in a certain spot. So later, after the onset of the winter, they will become a permanent feature in your garden. Put food out at night so that the birds will find it the next morning. And whatever you do, make sure that you make your feeder accessible from a raised landing area only. Otherwise, you will find yourself attracting some unwanted pests such as rodents like mice and worse still, rats. Continue feeding until early spring, when food becomes plentiful again. If you cannot serve them insects, then try to give the bird suet, a form of beef fat. You can buy this cheaply at pretty much any meat market, so it won't cost you an arm and a leg. As well as being nourishing, suet also has the advantage of not freezing during cold weather. Many birds will also enjoy crumbs, nuts and seeds. You can even serve them boiled potatoes and hard-boiled eggs, provided these are finely chopped. Other foods you probably have lying around in your store cupboard may also be used. Try feeding them raisins, figs, dried fruit generally, biscuits, boiled rice and so on as well. If you want to build a birdhouse or nesting box, I would encourage you to proceed by all means. These offer fine protection, especially for the smaller and more vulnerable species. You can buy ready-made nesting boxes and shelves for a very reasonable price these days. Alternatively, if you fancy your hand at doing a little DIY, they are not very difficult to build either. Most birds prefer houses made of rough slabs of wood covered with bark, which to the birds feels quite authentic and natural. If at all possible, try to match your birdhouse to the surroundings as well. So, if you paint your birdhouse, be sure to use a dull grey-green or brown colour. The simplest type of birdhouse to construct yourself consists of a hollow branch nailed to a tree. When you are erecting your birdhouses, be sure to place them a good distance apart from one another. Few bird species enjoy nesting in close proximity to competitors of their own kind. Cleanliness is vitally important too. Your bird nest should be cleaned out yearly to make room for new nesting material to be brought in by their seasonal tenants. Early autumn is the best time to prepare your birdhouse as the new season's chicks will have hatched and flown the coop, so to speak. Once cleaned, your birdhouses will be ready to welcome their spring visitors once they return to your neighbourhood early the next year. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.